Hi, today we've got something a little bit different to take a look at. This is a BMW electronic water pump that I've just taken out of the car because it's showing signs of failing. So I've managed to do all the replacement, everything's working nicely now. Uh, but I thought we'd have a look to see if we can see what it is that actually causes these water pumps to break. Now this is part of the cooling system in an internal combustion engine car. On older vehicles and more basic vehicles, what you'll find is that there's a mechanical water pump actually attached to the engine, driven by either the auxiliary belt or driven by the timing belt itself. And the pump spins whenever the engine is running because it's basically being driven by the crankshaft. Now, a while back, BMW introduced these electronic water pumps, which basically allows the coolant circuit to run independently of the engine. So they can change the speed of this independently of the engine speed. They can also run it after the engine is turned off to aid with cooling. And this can offer a whole range of benefits as well as some complications. But the benefits, generally speaking, are that the system can control the engine temperature um, in a much more dynamic way and potentially run the engine at more efficient operating point compared to what you would be able to with just a simple mechanical uh, pump driven by the engine. Now, any BMW owner will know that these pumps do like to fail and we've been extremely lucky this one's lasted about 140,000 miles and it's finally failed but uh, many people have found they've had to replace these at intervals of 25 or 30,000 miles which is uh, really quite short normally you'd replace the mechanical water pump when you change the timing belt so somewhere around 100,000 miles and um, so we've actually had quite a good innings from this one uh, but they are known to fail and the first sign that I got that something was wrong on here is that the engine code came up, although it didn't turn on the engine warning light, uh, it did say that it lost communication with the pump. And it was still circulating water, but I noticed the temperatures weren't quite what they were before. It seemed to run a bit lower. So I think the default strategy for this is to just run the impeller at maximum speed if it loses communication. So um, what we'll do is we'll try and take this apart today. I'm not sure how far we'll get, but it appears to be all screwed together. Um, even if we can't get these Torx screws out, I think I might try and drill them out because I am intrigued to see what's inside one of these. So basically what you have is an impeller at this end. It looks a little bit like a turbo, uh, but the water enters this impeller at this point here and it's basically driven outwards and pumped out of here. And then it enters the um, actually enters the engine block straight away on this particular vehicle. It's got a couple of mounting points, so three mounting points that would have had rubber bushings to try and dampen vibration. Uh, and then there's two holes here that mount onto the thermostat. So we're going to try and take this apart. First of all, let's have a look at the impeller. So we've got a couple of uh, fixings here. Let's take these off. Right, so that's the four machine screws out. Let's see if I can separate this. Oh, it's on tight. There might be uh, a gasket material in there. Interestingly, I've never heard of these actually leaking and failing mechanically. It tends to be the electronics, but... Maybe I'll just grab a screwdriver. I might need something a bit bigger. Oh, and there we go. So it's just sealed by an O-ring. There's no um, adhesive or anything like that. And it's a pretty small impeller, really, compared to what I've got in the Ford Mondeo. I'm going to replace that. It had a really quite a chunky impeller there. Uh, this one is pretty small. And the maximum speed for this is 250 RPM. So it's not even spinning ridiculously fast. Um, I've noticed with the new one, when it's running and idling, it's only running at about 40 RPM. It does throttle up if you're driving hard and it does throttle up if you turn on the heater which is definitely not needed at the moment um but yeah quite a small impeller really i expect to something a little bit bigger um but yeah so that's the impeller part that actually does all of the pumping so again the water just enters the center and as it's spinning it's forced out the side and forced to spin around and out through the exit now at this point everything should be dry inside the pump. This is the only part that gets wet because this is the part that's actually pumping the coolant. Uh, but where we've got the actual motor and the electronics itself, um, there's probably only a seal in terms of allowing for ingress protection because this is still exposed. It can get wet and covered in oil. You don't want that all over the electronics. Um, there's only two screws here. Oh, but that's well and truly stuck on there. I may need to... Um, 
there's not a lot to grip onto, so I may need to give this one a few taps with the hammer. Right, so I did not manage to separate the pump at this point here, but I have managed to get the back cover off with a lot of mechanical persuasion. Uh, the electrical connector did get damaged, and if you're interested, uh, the pinout is zero volts. We've got two 12 volt connections here, so one of them goes through a 20 amp fuse just for this water pump, and then there is another 12 volt connection which appears to be shared with a few items that are turned on and off with the ignition. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether that just disables sort of the highest speed so that it can overrun if it needs to. And then the third pin is a one wire serial connection that goes straight to the DME or the um, PCM, uh, the en engine management unit anyway. Uh, but I did manage to get the cover off and it looks like, well first of all, We've got a bit of debris here, which I don't know if that's something that has gone bang on the inside here. But then we've got what appears to be some kind of hybrid or ceramic construction, not a PCB as I was expecting. However, it's probably a good chance to um, talk about our sponsor for today's video, PCB Way. PCB Way offer a wide range of high quality services from standard PCBs with layer counts from one all the way up to 14 layers in a wide variety of surface finishes and solder mask colours in standard FR4, aluminium or Rogers HDI and copper base PCBs. They also do PCB assembly should you want your PCB to have all of the components assembled onto it, uh, through hole and surface mount components including uh, the possibility to get PCB way to order your parts from the various distributors. Now PCB Way are also currently celebrating their 8th anniversary of trading and if you click on the banner when you visit the PCB Way website you can get various free coupons. There's also a lottery type thing where you can win some modules or win PCB Way beans which allow you to buy some merchandise or use it towards your PCBs. And then we've also got some videos at the bottom here from other PCB Way supporters. So don't forget to visit PCB Way if you're thinking about getting some PCBs made or even if you're thinking about getting some mechanical parts machined. So a closer look at this, and as I said, it's probably not what I expected, but actually it probably makes sense to have this kind of construction. Now, if you think about what we've got in this car, this is literally bolted to this six cylinder petrol engine and the oil temperature in that can vary anywhere from about 110 degrees C all the way up to 150 degrees C. So this is in very close proximity to the engine. The coolant temperature, the maximum which is specified is somewhere around 125 degrees C for this engine. So we've got potentially 125 degrees C fluid around this area of the pump. We've got the pump sitting right next to the engine that could be running even hotter than that. So if we had a plain PCB with normally packaged components, we would be struggling with the temperatures in this area. And don't forget the pump itself, the motor in here is going to be generating its own heat as well. So we've got the three contacts that go off to the brushless motor. No encoder from what I can see unless it's at the end of this. Now the system is able to read the pump RPM. However, there are ways that you can do that without an encoder. You can read back the back EMF from these coils because you know how many poles the motor's got. You can work out what the pulses look like and you can work out the RPM of the motor without actually needing to use an encoder. Uh, but as I said, it might be hidden underneath this module somewhere. So we've got the three connections there and then they obviously go here into these three bare die transistors mounted onto this ceramic substrate. Uh, we've got a little uh, QR code. I'm not sure if that is hiding a little IC or something like that. We've got an inductor here, which seems to be somewhere in line with the ground connection. So I think this is for noise suppression, that kind of thing. We've got some ceramic capacitors. We've got what looks like a tantalum capacitor. Now this one, interestingly, has got some markings on it, although I think that might just be dirt from when I've opened it up. No, it's it's not that that's blown. Um, and then we've got an electrolytic capacitor at the front. So maybe I'll just snip these leads and see if we can actually separate this from the motor, although it appears to have some kind of thermal adhesive here onto the actual motor chassis for heat sinking. Right, so the module itself doesn't want to come away uh, easily, although this is quite a flaky epoxy, it does break up quite easily. 
I think the whole surface area underneath is just too much for me to separate it without damage. So I think what we're going to do is start cutting off some of these external components and then break away the black plastic and then we can see what's underneath all of it. So uh, let's start snipping off some of these components. We've got the electrolytic capacitor here. Oh, and I think we may have separated something. And it looks like we've still got the wire bonds onto the ceramic, but we've lifted the plastic away. So let's give those a little snip. Now, if you're wondering about the electrolytic capacitor, what we've got here is a Nishikon BX series electrolytic capacitor, 35 volts, 220 microfarads. Uh, let's test it on the peak ESR meter. And we're measuring 221.8 microfarads, 0 0.08 ohms ESR. So performing still as good as the day it was installed, which is really impressive, considering this has been in this pump subject to all those heat cycles. And uh, this pump was actually built in 2007. So we're talking about a 15-year-old pump here. And this capacitor is still perfect. And if we look at the data sheet, um, we have the 0 to 100 volt, uh, sorry, 10 to 100 volt version. So this is rated for minus 55 to 150 degrees C. So that's why it's been able to survive. But that really does give an indication that these Nishikon capacitors are the real deal. And we've seen failures of other capacitors with much less harsh environments than this. So it looks like if you want a really long life on your device, these Nishikon capacitors are the ones to go for. So on the plastic part here, we've just got that electrolytic capacitor, some ceramic capacitors, we've got the inductor, and then we've got these wire bonds that go off to the ceramic PCB. And these are really, really flexible wires, very thin, uh, and it looks like we've got four strands per motor terminal. On this side, there's not really anything to show. Uh, we've got this really sticky conformal coating, uh, which is still very, very flexible, uh, but there's not really much else. We had the three connections off to the motor, and then it looked just like three connections that went on to the board. So the 12 volt, the additional 12 volt, and then probably the comms coming from the connector. And then ground, I'm sure that PCB is picking it up from the actual motor chassis itself. So that's the top part that clipped on to the ceramic PCB. Let's take a closer look at that PCB. So here is our ceramic PCB, and this is very tightly thermally bonded to the chassis of the motor. I wasn't able to separate it, and that does all of the heat sinking to keep all of the components on this ceramic PCB at the same temperature as the chassis of the motor, which obviously should be less than 150 degrees C. Now, on this side, we've got some very familiar looking components in traditional packages. Uh, all of these are standard surface mount devices, and then we've got some possibly alien looking parts to some people. These are uh, bare die transistors. So these are our power MOSFETs, and there's another one here, that actually drive the brushless motor. And these have been selected for maximum thermal coupling between the die itself and the chassis, because if we just mounted these in plastic packages, we'd have all of the thermal interfaces adding up, adding some thermal resistance, and we'd probably see those MOSFETs fail quite early. Now this is a brushless motor electrically commutated with the six MOSFETs. So we've got three on the low side, three on the high side, and that allows us to switch, switch each of the coils uh, to allow us to uh, turn the motor. So this side looks like it's probably the high side, 12 volts up here. Uh, then the low side, we've got a current sense shunt at 0 0.002 ohm so that the uh, MCU or whatever it is can monitor the current through the pump and then we've got another MOSFET here, uh, which seems to do some kind of global switching for the motor as well. So maybe that's uh, a way of turning off the motor uh, fully or something to do with that auxiliary 12 volt supply that was provided to the pump. Now, um, it looks like I'd missed a couple of connections. So this is actually where the power comes in. It didn't quite make sense that these tiny connections over here with these thin tracers would be the 12 volts coming in. So it actually comes in this side next to all of these ceramic capacitors and obviously right next to all of the power electronics. Uh, so that's fed right next to the inductor on the black plastic part. Uh, and that gives us the 12 volts into here. 
I don't really see much in the way of voltage regulation or anything like that. Um, so I'm not sure if this um, IC here is obviously capable of driving, uh, of running from 12 volts. And it probably is because it looks like there's not much in the way of interfacing between it and these MOSFETs here. We've basically got some gate drivers made from discrete transistors. That's why we've got six of them for the six transistors here. Um, and these are being driven off here. So this is obviously our communications interface. Now, on a device like this in an automotive environment, you wouldn't just feed a one-wire connection straight into a microcontroller. You do need to be able to clamp it and condition it to make sure that we're not injecting high voltages into here in the event of a fault or in the event of spikes. So since it's a one-wire connection, basically it's listening to the bus on one pin and then there'll be another pin which is able to drive uh, probably through these transistors on here to be able to shunt and pull that um, communications line low. Normally it would be up high uh, but a bit like an I2C interface you'll be able to pull it low so that it, the slave devices can all communicate back to the engine management unit. And then we've got various ceramic capacitors here. The actual part here, I'm not sure if you'll be able to read it, is a Pierre Berg IC, which is the actual brand of the pump. They're the people that make it. Uh, it's got a BMW logo in it, but BMW don't make any of these electronics. This is made by Pierre Berg. Uh, you might just be able to see the P logo there. I wasn't able to find anything from these part numbers on here. So I think this is just a generic, um, possibly an ASIC, possibly a microcontroller, specifically designed for driving these electric pumps. Uh, but it's quite an interesting construction, possibly something that you've not seen before. Um, and in all honesty, this one doesn't seem to have anything wrong from what I can see. I can't see any damaged components anywhere. So I'm guessing uh, just from its pure age and number of thermal cycles that something, either maybe a, um, a solder joint has failed from the thermal cycling or maybe just a component has failed in a way that we can't see. Um, the explanation for people that have had pumps that have failed very early uh, possibly just down to general electronics failure or something wrong with the assembly. I think it's, as with any electronics device, you are going to have failures of components, uh, and I'd put it down to that. But um, this one's lasted pretty well, and I don't really see anything wrong with this board whatsoever. So that's a look inside a BMW electronic water pump. Uh, the replacement went pretty straightforward. It's just a little bit hampered by access. The subframe is in the way. Uh, but I managed to replace the pump and the thermostat, no problems whatsoever. These pumps themselves uh, sell for somewhere around 150 to 250 pounds, depending on who you buy it from. Uh, so fairly expensive, but as I said, this one lasted really quite a long time, so I'm not going to complain about the cost of that. Anyway, if you've got any thoughts or comments, don't forget to leave them in the comments section down below. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, PCBWay. And until next time, thanks for watching.